Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Good evening. You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoy another exciting episode of our show. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Straight Talk with Dana Mark. Welcome to December. Well, yeah, something like that. It's December 7th, 32 degrees here in the great state of New Jersey. Once it drops one more time, we're below the freezing point. So make sure that y'all bundle up, man, because uh, it's getting a little cold outside and you don't want to get caught out there and uh, end up freezing. One thing I wanted to do first and foremost before we really start, is uh, send condolences to the family of Natalie DeSell Reed. You may remember her from uh, the movie BAPS, a couple of the Dia movies. Um, you know, lost a battle with colon cancer today at the age of 53 years old. And we just wanted to send uh, condolences from the Straight Talk with Dana Mark family out to the Reed family um, it's got to be hard especially during this time right before Christmas and the holidays and all of that good stuff speaking of that make sure that you know we continue to exercise precautions because we're, we're coming up on round two of this uh, pandemic man and, and it's really doing a number on people you know a million cases so far, like right after Thanksgiving, and it just spiked right back up. They're saying if we don't do something or go back to what we were doing, maybe we got to shut down again. And it just has to be. I know a lot of people don't really want to shut down, but um, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci, he says healthy Americans won't get the vaccine until April of 21. He says healthy Americans should not expect to receive a coronavirus vaccine until April and that healthcare workers, the elderly, and people with chronic health conditions would be prioritized. A healthy, non-elderly person with no recognizable underlying conditions will likely start in the end of March, early April. Once you get into April, probably full blast with those individuals, Fauci said during a CNN town hall uh, meeting on Friday. He said what we would really like to see is once you get in the open season in the sense of anybody can get it, that we really have a full court press on getting people vaccinated. The quicker you get the overwhelming majority of the country vaccinated, the quicker you're going to have that umbrella of herd immunity that would be so, so important to bring in the level of the virus way, way down. Um, he said vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. We're just about ready to go, and some clinics have already begun receiving materials. Um, he said he expected healthcare workers and the most at risk could begin receiving injections this month after the Food and Drug Administration's grant and emergency use authorization. Now, Fauci has served as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. So, if you put it in context, since Ronald Reagan was the president, and they do have a special on. Showtime now, um, the Reagans. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. There's some some interesting stuff in there, and it's almost like what we are seeing now is a replay of what we were seeing then. But Dr. Fauci has served six U.S. presidents, soon to be seven, when President Biden takes office. Um, and you know he will stay on. Like I said, he will stay on after Joe Biden is sworn in. He would serve as the administration's chief medical advisor. So we might want to start paying attention to what he says. And before I bring my right-hand man in, I just wanted to say 
the Trump administration declined an offer from Pfizer in the late summer for additional COVID-19 uh, vaccine doses. They had the option from Pfizer to buy more doses. They were like, nah, we're going to wait and see what the FDA says. So now other countries jumped on. They uh, bought it up. Bought up all the, you know, all the vaccine with, with options to get more. So now what it's looking like is if you don't get vaccinated in this first round, you might have to wait until June the 21. So this is something to think about, something to keep your eye on and something to consider considering that the pandemic is on full force on the second wave and it's not uh, being too kind in its return. But let's get to the show. It's the six man Dane Geronimo. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And from NJ to NC, I'm in the studio with my right hand man, Mark Lee. So Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, you know, we just had two very interesting shows on the International Broadcast Media Television Network, and I'll share a little bit about those. We also had a very crazy weekend, so that's why you did not get material from me that we usually would get for our network on the Saturday and Sunday shows because uh, we were having some uh, technical difficulties with the show that Zach okay. does, and then we just ran a rerun on Sunday. So we won't run the rerun. I'll see what it looks like in terms of the copy for the uh, Saturday show, but we were just having one of them crazy days and everything for today actually turned out to be pretty good. There was a couple of things that were glitches and all, but I had the pleasure of talking to a gentleman from Dublin, Dublin, Ireland, wow. on the show, and he's actually a DJ. So we were talking about how the radio market has got, like, parent companies and stuff, even in Ireland, and so they have some similarities to what's going on there. But, yeah, JJ was his name, and he's uh, involved in two commercial radio stations there in Dublin, Ireland. So I got to get my uh, – my, my knowledge of Dublin out of the way, so I learned that they are into hurling, and uh, they do know what curling is, but there's another sport that apparently is more Gaelic or Irish oriented that is called hurling, so I got to learn about hurling, got to learn about some foods, got to learn that they do like Guinness over there, because I know sometimes, I think it's Australia that thinks uh, that Foster yeah. is more like uh, Budweiser and everything, but they do like their Guinness even in Ireland, so apparently they like their national beer that we like, because you know, sometimes you'll go to those countries and you mention a beer that we think is one of their top beers, and they'll look at you like, that's water as far as we're concerned and everything. Because I know I had that conversation <laughs> with a friend of mine about Foster's, and I thought it was Foster's was all that. And he's like, nah, you come to Australia, we got some stuff for you that is much better than some Foster's. So they got some national beers that they thought were much better. But he, like I said, they do like their Guinness there in Ireland, and they do like their sports, and he shared it, how they're doing with the pandemic. So we had a conversation of about 45 minutes to 50 minutes that he was there, and then I chilled and played some music and did some other things and then Kim jumped on the conversation along with Steve Rao and then later on in the evening on the second show I had my good buddy uh, Ronnie Warner come in and break down some serious film knowledge because like I said he's a filmmaker so okay. he talked for about 40 minutes or so with some filmmakers that I know that do a show called Talking Upstream that's on the platform and then he was just breaking out some knowledge including how he got the movie This Christmas Made about doing a concert in the streets where he did the Martin show out in the 90s and everything and just how he's involved in the industry and some of the things that he's doing and as he's wheeling and dealing and making deals so he got to share a lot of the knowledge of the film industry with our listening audience he did have to bounce off because he was uh he was doing a zach he was doing a funk music from the front seat only we were doing film 101 <laughs> from the front seat because he was literally driving and you know with his family it wasn't after a wheeling and dealing moment because he was driving with his family heading on back home i believe it was and everything so like i said uh we got but he did pop in and we did have a 50 minute conversation i tried to get him back on in the not too distant in the future, and then right after that, Dr. Barose, who is originally from India, but who is a technologist and involved in with a lot of stuff around disability because he's got a son in the autism spectrum. So he joined in. We had a nice hour-long conversation with him about everything from disability to equality to which way things are going with technology to AI and a lot of other things. So we definitely had a very in-depth conversation on a lot of different fronts, and I think folks will learn a lot whenever we download the audio and put it in our platform and everything of that nature. So they're in for a definite treat 
in that regard. And like I said, we had some rain yesterday. I think it was sunny today. And it's starting to be a little bit on the chilly side. And, of course, like you mentioned, Pfizer has got offices here. So, and, of course, a couple of the other companies have got companies here. So people are paying attention to what's going on. But as I heard you say, the second wave is not playing and is not playing nicely if it's playing right. at all because it's right. definitely causing all kinds of problems. I think our governor is even thinking about possibly – and we need to see our figures go back down. But if they do not go down, he is not taking it off the table that we might have to go back into one of those more extensive lockdowns. I believe California's already done that. And I think that even in New York and New Jersey, y'all might eventually do that. I don't know what how things are going with y'all's cases. But there are a number well, of places that are uh, looking at the possibility of further lockdowns and tighter lockdowns like what we had back in the uh, spring and early summer. Yeah, what they did was um, reduce the... You know, we used to be able to have gatherings up to 150 people, depending right. on, you know, what kind of venue it was. That's all been reduced to like 25 folks. You know, they said uh, churches can have up to 100 people. But right now, with all this stuff going on, man, let's just go and lock back in. That's just my thought. We did it the first time. The only thing I ask that people will do, man, is don't go into the damn store buying up all the toilet paper and, and things that you know like don't hoard the toilet paper man then try to turn around and sell it because you got too much in your house you know so be sensible about it we've been here now we've seen what it what it already did it went away just for a little bit to come back with more force so let, let's use our brains and, and you know Start paying attention to the experts. I mean, Dr. Fauci has, has served six United States presidents, man. He's been doing this since 1984 when what they used to call AIDS. Yes, right. And remember when they first started, they called it AIDS. And then people was like, man, that's AIDS. You know, same thing. It's just a different way. But when, when it first dropped, Dr. Fauci was there in, the, in that Reagan administration. And he served every president since then, and he will serve President Biden when he gets mm-hmm. in the office. So I'm quite sure you don't keep a job that long and you don't know what you're talking about. You know, that so, is very true. But, you know, they try to throw all of the stuff in between, just like the, the current administration is trying to downplay that whole situation where Pfizer was like, listen. You bought these, you bought 50 million doses. Here, we're going to give you first dibs on some more doses. And they were like, nah, we got to check with the FDA. Man, the FDA can't help me right now. If Pfizer can help get this thing and get some people vaccinated and get more people vaccinated so that people are not falling out, uh, put on respirators and incubators and everything else, you know what? But then again, we have not the smartest will on the car driving the vehicle. So, look at what happened. Oh, you said he's driving you know the vehicle I mean? he don't know what he's doing? Right, he got square tires on, on on a round car, you know what I mean? And it's just a lumpy ride all the way down. And, you know, he's going to downplay it. Shoot, he downplayed it. And then the next day, his boy is still in the hospital. Rudy Giuliani's well, laid on. out. That was you know not supposed to happen. Don't oh, worry no. about it, man. This, this is how t- it, it's radio, man. We live. This, this is doing it. <laughs> uh oh, you sound like you, you walked away from the mic for one second. There we go. Hold on. There we While go. I try to stop this crazy thing going on. But, yeah, I agree. He's just got all kinds of things going on. So uh, keep on talking. I'm actually going to do what I have to do in order to get them off. So let's hold on a second. Oh, you got somebody on? Well, we got no, somebody. It was, uh, yeah, hold on. So just, hold on. Because I'll tell you what's going on in a second once I figure it out. Because we have one of the moments and everything. So oh, there oh, we go. Okay. Hopefully that stopped. Huh? Hopefully that stopped. Uh, the great thing about Androids and phones in general, no, that did not stop it. Hold on. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, hang up, and then I'm going to take care of this, but I'll call right back. 
All right. <laughs> we'll be right back. And then I'll, expl- I'll explain it when I call. I'll explain it when I call back. I got you, bro. We'll be right back, right. y'all. Let's straight talk with Dana Mark. We're gonna let the music play for a second, and then we'll be right back. All right, bro, you, got you, got? you got a little modern technology. I was using this new phone I got, this new Android I got, and everything of that nature. But while I was using the phone, you know, one of the games, because, you know, I had downloaded a couple of games. So, um, do you want to be a millionaire? And yes, I would love to be a millionaire, but I can't afford to be a millionaire. <laughs> it decided it didn't want to come on at the same time as I was trying to make the phone call. So, I guess it wanted to be to play the game. It. And I was looking at it like, no, I'm busy right now. I cannot play the game right now. So, I then I, I think I played maybe five games of that earlier today. You know, I'm using all okay. my words with friends and things along those lines. But it decided that it wanted me to play it right then and there. And I'm going like, no, it's showtime. I can't play you right yeah, now. It's You're going to have to wait right? till later. <laughs> like, listen, holler at me after the show. In fact, while you were doing that, we do have standing by. Miss yes. uh, Crystal Myrick, so she's actually and I'm looking standing forward to hear from, I'm right looking forward now. to hear from Crystal Myrick, and we might even get a musician calling as well, and she might have some other people. And let me tell you a little bit about Crystal and this amazing event that she did, and that's part of the reason I wanted her to call in. And I'm going to see if Isabel is going to call in as well. But I was, you know, I'm oftentimes talking about the places that I grew up. Everybody knows that Durham is home, and I do consider it home. But I grew up, in terms of my growing up years, in a little small town called Warrington, and Warrington is up there near the Virginia border. And they've got like a really cool environment and things of that nature. So I went to, I think I moved there when I was in the fifth grade or something like that. So we'll say from fifth to sixth grade through my high school years and into college, I was living in Warrington because that's where my folks started their radio station. So I do consider Warrington a hometown as well since it was my growing up years and all of that. So I do consider it one of my hometowns as well. And I actually run a Facebook page about So You Grew Up in Warrington or something like that. And I actually maintain that page. But she he does a blog called The Warrington, Warrenist, and it's about folks in Warren County, which is Warrington, North Carolina, and they did a virtual holiday. I was really impressed with what they did, and I wanted to talk about it, but I mean, they had folks that were breaking down like their recipes. They had some singers. They just had a truly amazing event, and it was done virtually because, you know, it's the pandemic, so everything's virtually these days. So I wanted to talk to her to find out, one, how they pulled it off, and also i got to find out how she got one of their major surprise guests because they had a, a serious surprise guest that a lot of people will be amazed that they were able to get that particularly those that are here in North Carolina and things of that nature but that person opens the whole show so I'm just interested in learning more about how my old hometown is going and about this crazy virtual event so if you want to bring Crystal in we'll have a whole conversation around that and I think she might even have some of the people coming into the show because I know she was asking about the telephone number and hopefully they'll be calling in as well but if you want to uh, bring her in and we'll have a conversation around this truly amazing event I I mean, I just happened to stumble across it. I think a friend of mine sent me the link, and I think I watched pretty much at least the majority, if not all of it. But I definitely thoroughly enjoyed what I saw. So if you'll bring Crystal in, we'll have a conversation around what she's got going on. She's actually in the studio right now. Ms. Myrick, welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Ma. You are now on the line. How's it going, fellas? All right. I'm doing good. How are you doing, Crystal? So, one, you're in Warrington or Warren County. What got you there? Are you a Warren native? Because, like I said, I was a transplant there way back in the 70s, since I'm in my late 50s now, and I did enjoy spending a number of my growing up years there, and I have friends that are 
natives of that town as well as some that are like me were transplants and some of us have moved away from there but that, I was truly impressed with what y'all were able to accomplish so I'd love to learn more about this and you're going to have to tell Dean because maybe Dean will want to do a virtual event in New Jersey where he is so if you can tell him how he can get the governor of New Jersey or the governor of New York for any virtual events they want to know I'm sure he would love to know that because y'all managed to get the governor of North Carolina to open this whole thing up <laughs> Right, right. Um, well, what I did, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and also thank you for tuning in last night. It was um, Pat Murray from the Durham Style Writer who tagged you um, yes. on the show. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised right here in Warrington. Um, I've been here the majority of my life, except for maybe about three or four years uh, when I lived in Raleigh. Um, but yeah, so um, I came up with the idea to do this virtual festival. It was called Falling for the Holidays. Um, I knew with the pandemic, you know, with everything was canceled. So, um, and I always wanted to have an event. Um, actually, and I've always wanted to have a virtual event. You know, this was like, you know, pre pandemic um, because I saw how things were just going as far as like technology wise and. Um, just being more um, budget-friendly, I could say. Um, so, yeah, just getting it all together, talking to people, saying, hey, what do you think if I did this, and what are your thoughts? And they're like, well, hey, you know, nothing else is going on. So, um, And I just got the ball rolling, and I contacted people. Um, like I said, I reached out to um, um, Governor Roy Cooper's office, just to see if, you know, they would be interested in doing a holiday message. I was like, you know, maybe about 30 seconds. I know he's incredibly busy. It would be great if he could do it. If not, I totally understand. And they emailed me back um, the very next day. I said, okay, um, all right, we'll see what we can do. And then maybe about a week later, they sent me um, a video, and it was what you saw uh, last night. Wow, definitely. And uh, now how much of it was done um, live or was everybody done on video clips? Because I'm imagining most of these were video clips, like I said. So how did you organize yours? Because I was actually involved with Centerfest, and I know that we did half of our – I'm not, sorry, Centerfest, yeah, both Centerfest and the Eno, which are two festivals in Durham. Half of it was live and half of it was, as I call it, Memorex. So half of it was taped clips, and then the other half was folks doing live events. So was there any live events that were going on yesterday? Or was that all pretty much recorded? Because I know the guy that at the end who is Latin American and is a violin player, player it looked like he was a pre-recorded because i heard somebody mentioning that they had seen that clip somewhere before oh right 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 that was um well someone had actually put up a teaser but they didn't know okay. um what it was about they're like oh he, oh he's you know um pretty well known actually around the world as far as a cellist so they saw this teaser but they didn't realize that he was part of my festival they knew about the festival but they didn't put them together and so, but yeah, um, the entire thing was pre-recorded um, and uploaded to Facebook. Um, that's the platform that I chose to um, air it. Um, so yeah, everything was pre-recorded. I didn't want to run into any issues as far as like if someone's Wi-Fi wasn't working um, or anything like that. So that's the route that I took, at least for this one. Yeah, and that makes sense. And even when you do those things live and everything, it's uh, easier if it's pre-recorded. Because now, did you have everybody do? Because um, I know on some platforms you have to do like you can't do more than five or ten minute clips and everything. So was everybody's clip pretty much five minutes or under, or did you have any that exceeded those clips? And were there any clips that you wish you had been able to put in there that you weren't able to put in? Because I know that always happens with editing. There's things that you're going like, I really wish I could have gotten that in there, but it either wasn't quite the quality you wanted or it wasn't quite the uh, same uh, aspect that you wanted. So is there some things like that that you, if you could have, put them in there, you would have, but they might not have been quite the professional level you would have liked that you had with everything that I saw. Okay, well, the majority of the clips, um, like the holiday greetings, you know, I pretty much told everyone, if you can keep it under about 30 seconds, that would be great, because um, I wanted to fit in as much as I could. Um, I knew the other segments, such as, like, the cooking segments and um, the cellist and um, 
I knew those were going to be longer. And so I wanted so oh, and I'm sorry, and also story time. So I knew they were going to be longer but, clips, and I didn't mind. Um, I knew there were some restrictions with Facebook as far as, like, how long um, a video can be. And so um, I did very little editing, and everyone that sent me something, I included them. You know, so I'm like, if you took the time out to record a message, I'm going to fit you in there some way, somehow, and that's what I did. So. Yeah, there, there were some great messages. I saw that y'all also had, and I can't remember whether, it, I know she was one of the talent winners from one of those national talent competitions, but I can't remember exactly where Brooke Simpson was at, whether it was American Got Talent or whether it was The Voice, but I know she was in one of those. I think it was The Voice. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And Warren County, we were rooting for her. We were supporting her. We had her face everywhere. You know, it's like, hey, it airs on this night. Make sure you call in. We got to vote. We got to win. Um, unfortunately, she didn't win. But what I did um, during that time was um, I said, you know, it's okay. I, and I listed a number of celebrities who had also lost singing competitions. You know, it was like, um, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like Britney Spears and Jennifer Hudson and, um, Beyonce, you know, these people who lost me in competitions, but look at where they are. So my post, this was, you know, from a couple of years ago, I said, hey, girl, don't worry about it. I said, you know, as long as you keep the right people around you, you'll be good to go, you know. And she's still, yeah, you know, doing her thing. Yeah, she released a um, a Christmas song um, titled oh, cool. I Got You. Yeah, so, but, yeah, she was in it. I reached out to her, and she said, you know, great, I would love to. And she sent me back a video, and, yeah, well, you saw that, too. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm trying to remember. I want to say that because I know that the two that are winners were from North Carolina or the two that were longtime finalists. I can't remember if they won or not because um, when Clay Aikens and Ruben Studer, Studdard went against each other, I think Ruben actually won, it, if I remember correctly, but your memory Correct. might be better than mine. So, that, so, yeah, so Clay Aikens would be a non-winner. And the lady from High Point, I don't think that she won either. Um, and Dean <laughs> might jump in and remind me who that is. I know it begins with an F. But. No, Fantasia, she won. No, oh, that's right. Fantasia did win. Fantasia did win the whole yes. thing. But yes, but mm-hmm. Clay finished in second place. So Clay finished in second place. So Brooke finished in second place. No problem. She'll probably go ahead and get that big record contracts and all of that kind of stuff because we have had a few winners from North Carolina and a few that came close, like uh, Clay and like now Brooke. So we've had a couple of folks that have definitely been in that field and everything. Now, have you always wanted to do things in this kind of event space? And do you do a lot of events there in the Warren County area? Or is this something something that's newer in your life in terms of interest, or is that something you've always wanted to be involved in, the event space? Well, um, for me, I've always wanted to be involved in media. Um, uh-huh. That was really, like, yeah, you know, like with um, journalism, I went to school for communications with a concentration in print journalism. Um, and so as far as the events, I would go to them, of course, like all the time, you know, pre-pandemic, of course. But And I said, you know, I want to do something like this. And so my first one was a few years ago. Um, it was called The Women of Soul City. And I know you know all about Soul City. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so there was a documentary. And so um, with the help of some wonderful people, um, I was able to um, organize a, a showing of the documentary and then it was followed by a all women um, panel, discussion panel to talk about Soul City. So uh, for that one, like I had um, Dr. McKissick, um, mm-hmm. I had um, Jane Ballgroom, uh, Wilmina Kearney, uh, Magnolia Jackson, Ms. Abdeen, um, Ms. Absan Abdeen, and to do my closing, I had Congresswoman Eva Clayton. Okay. So that was pretty amazing. That was like my first like outing. Um, my first event that I've ever done. And so from that point on, I said, I want to do another one, but I don't know what I want to do. And I, I'm like, I want to really make an impact when I do it. And so fast forward to, you know, last night, and that's what I did. Well, like I said, last but night's I, event was truly, 
I said last night's event was truly amazing. Now, one of the things I know that everybody that watches is into, as well as uh, me and Dean do a lot of our good food and everything, and you did have those chefs that were doing those kitchen uh, displays and everything. So tell about how that came about, because I think you had one that was doing the confectionaries or, like, snacks and everything, and then you had the other person that was doing a more traditional-type dish. But how did that come about, and are those affiliated with restaurants there in Warren County? Okay, well, the um, the lady that you're talking about who um, baked the whoopie pies, she um, has a company. It's called Sweet Delight Cookies. Um, she has these huge cookies. They're so good. They're in Durham. I have to um, point them out to you. I have to tell you where they are. But she has several locations, um, Warren County, Virginia, um, just everywhere, and they're delicious. And so I asked her, um, you know, if she could do this for me and she said yeah and so that's how that video came about and then with um chef ryan um he is the chef of robinson ferry which is here in warrington um and i spoke to Kristen tabor who owns uh robinson ferry and i told her you know what i was doing i said you know I'm, you know i want to add some cooking segments and she said oh well, i can get chef ryan to do one for you i said oh okay and so that's how that one came about. Yeah, so that one, you know, people were um, very willing and very grateful. I'm sorry, not grateful. That's not the word I'm used. Were very gracious with their time wanting to, you know, assist me with this festival because, you know, with the Warrenists, it's about celebrating the art, the culture, the lifestyle, the people, the community of this area. And, you know, being that you're from here, you know, so oh, yeah. for me to do the warnings, you know, like I said, I want to celebrate all of that. Um, you know, if you look at the news, you know, it's like negative, and I don't want to do that. I want to stay positive. There's a lot more positive yeah. stuff that's going on that you don't hear about. And so because what I do is positive, um, people don't mind saying, hey, okay, I can do this for you. I can contribute this. And so that's how those two segments came about. But that was really how – all of them came about, um, like story time at the Warren County Memorial Library. You know, everything was, because everything was positive, and we're all stuck in the house. Well, not really stuck in the house, but, we, yeah, we are. Um, and everything's, you know, shut down and no festivals and all that. And we're here at the holidays. You know, we want to do something, and so that was my contribution. I'd say. Well, that was a great contribution, and I noticed that you had a uh, longtime family friend on the, the show because she's part of the Hata Quilted Circle, but then y'all have also got that tremendous quilt exhibit that y'all have got up there in Warrington. So I did notice that Jerry Ann King, who's one of my mom's best friends, was involved in what you had and everything. So definitely I saw that she was displaying all these tremendous um, quilts that are in one of the houses, which apparently is the historical house there in Warren County. So I was don't know if you want to share a little bit about Jerry Ann's involvement with it as well. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so Jerry Ann King Johnson, she pretty much adopted me um, into their quilt group. Um, I met her about five years ago um, with the Stitching Life Stories project, which was we wrote a short story about our life, and then we had to incorporate And so um, I was involved in the project and had the whole Heritage Quilters group um, do this. And so um, I asked them again, I said, hey, you know, we couldn't do any tours and anything like that this year. How about if we incorporate, you know, some sort of virtual tour into my festival? And they were all for it. So um, it was quilts from, we have um, women and men in the group, and they each talked about their quilts. And so that was a definitely a another highlight of the evening. Yeah, definitely. It looks like it was a great highlight and everything. Now, for those that are not as familiar, and I know that, I've, like I said, I spent all my growing up years there and everything. And Dean's actually spent some of his uh, has family in Virginia and everything, and went to school in Virginia at one of the HBCUs. But for those that are not familiar with Warrington and only know it because of like you said, some people might know Salt City, definitely the movie. Definitely people remember um, the great uh, newspaper um, publisher, Horace Greeley, and know that he's got – some people that know history know that he's got a quote there about the time that he was in Warren County and everything, and he's the guy that wrote the – 
that said the quote, go west, young man, and all of that. And then, of course, folks do know about the infamous um, chemical dump that was there that kind of burst the environmental justice movement and things of that nature. But that's just some of the highlights and one of the lowlights. But for those that are not familiar as much as I am with Warren County, and, of course, I think I mentioned Soul City, which is going to be one of the um, – if it had come to its full fruition, it would have been the – first fully developed African-American run city. Like I said, it definitely that was the vision that Floyd uh, Sr., who was the, one of the founders of CORE, had in his mind and everything. But for those that don't know those kind of historical elements, what are some of the things that you would encourage people to know about that home area of Warren County and the reason that you love still being there and calling it at home, even though, like I said, some people like urban, some people like rural, and it's definitely a rural community, but it's still a beautiful community. So what are some of the things that you would say about about that area that would encourage them to come and visit Warren County if they haven't gone through, if they're driving down to Raleigh and they're passing down um, 95 and going into Henderson. And if they just veer off a little bit, that could be a Warrington. But what are some of the things that you would let them know about Warren County and Warrington and its surrounding areas? Oh, wow. There's a lot. I mean, really is a lot. And I'm not saying that just because I live here, but, I mean, there really is um, – one thing that people like to point out about Warren County, they always like to talk about the lake, Lake Gaston. Mm-hmm. But right. as far as like Warrington, oh my gosh, there's a, oh gosh, there's like this feel to the area that it's like, it just feels like home. Um, even when I moved away for a few years and I came back, it just felt like I was, you know, just swooped back in and just like embraced. Um, but Warrington, especially in the last, I'm going to say, like, three, four years, um, it has grown. Um, there was a time when it was, I mean, I'll be honest, it was stagnant. You know, um, the underwritten, the unwritten rule was that, oh, you know, once you graduate, you got to leave. There's nothing here. But that's not the case anymore, and it's grown a lot. Um, I'm not sure in the last time you've um, – You've been around, uh, Mark, but, you know, we have, like, a lot of little um, stores on Main Street now. Um, we have, like, you know, these great restaurants. Um, we have a park. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, Dr. Julian uh, Haywood. Um, he donated land for us to have a park, like, in Warrington. And it's so beautiful. It's so great. Um, we have a, not one, but two um, vineyards in Warren County now. Uh, One is Kim's Vineyard, and we have uh, Seven Springs. Um, Gosh, I wouldn't even know where to start. We really do have a lot going on now. I'm really, like, people who are away, but now they've, you know, come back or they go and look at my my page, um, the Warrenists, they're like, that's going on in Warrenton? That's going on in Warren County. They, you know, that wasn't going on when I was there. And I'm like, yeah, a lot has changed. <laughs> so, um, but the area is definitely moving forward um, as far as, like, a lot of um, things that are going on, a lot of places that are opening, and a lot of new development. So, but Yeah, it sounds like a lot of great developments then. It sounds like a lot of great developments, and I know that I saw that there was, like, some restaurants and things along that line as well that were not there when I was there. And like I said, my uh, mom lives in Rocky Mount, which is Nash County, and I do still have relatives in Hollister, which is down the road. So I've been through Warrington recently, but I haven't been in Warrington in a number of years. I do need to get back and visit. I know mom actually went to that house where the quilt is at because Jerry Ann had told her that uh, she would love her to see it, and I think she did that, like, a couple of weeks ago. So she was really impressed with that house and the way that y'all have made that into a, like a historical um, exhibit space and everything of that nature. But definitely it's been a minute, so I do need to get back there. And I know my friends who were doing the Road to the Apollo were trying to figure out places to bring that show, and Warrington was on the list of possible locations. I think the closest we came was Henderson, and we did have some contestants from Warrington, but unfortunately we did not have uh, – a venue in Warrington that we were using. So we went up to that new venue in Henderson to do the show there. And like you said, everything's on hold. So I don't even know whether we've talked about doing a virtual event, but we haven't quite figured out the logistics as well as uh, the founder of that event is kind of in the middle of some family changes. So we have to figure out what's going on with that and, and 
until we make our next changes and make our next decisions. But I know something will probably happen in 2021, 2022 at the latest. So definitely I knew that there was a lot of talent there, and I know that there's been a whole lot of talent, even sports-wise. That's the thing that I was surprised about. I don't remember, and I don't know all the athletes, but I don't know if I saw any sports figures that were on the video, and I know that there have been some sports figures that have graduated in the past that used to be from Warren County High. So did you reach out to any of them, or did I just miss them? Oh, I did reach out to some. Um, some weren't able to do it at the time. Um, but I do have something else that I'm working on. So I'm pretty sure that some will pop up in the next okay. one. I, I'm not going to say too much now. <laughs> Fair enough. That's the best way to do a business, mm-hmm. to leave folks wanting to know more and things of that nature. So you are thinking about some more of virtual events for 2021 already in your mind and everything that you're hoping to get off the ground. And tell folks about the blog and how often the blog comes out and also how folks can – uh, subscribe to the blog if they want to learn more about these treats of Warrington. And then my next question after you do that is I want to know some of your favorite restaurants to go to because I did see that there were several great restaurants there and you mentioned a couple, but I didn't know if you had some personal favorites that folks should be trying to stop by and grab their bites from. So this is a two-part question. One is about the uh, blog and how folks can learn about the blog and then your favorite restaurants. Okay. Well, um, it's uh, the dot com. It's T H E W A R R E N I S T dot com. They can go and subscribe to my newsletter. Um, and then on Facebook and Instagram, they're both at the Warrenist. Um, as far as like favorite places to eat, um, I love to eat. Period. So um, I love on Main. That one is right on Main Street. Um. I love, uh, um, there's a place, it's relatively new. It opened actually this year during the pandemic called Chili Chicken. They're really good. They have great ice cream and sandwiches. It's really good. Um, oh, gosh, there's a lot. Uh, drip, uh, coffee, that's on Main Street. Robinson Ferry is on Main Street. Um, Lake Gaston Pizza, um, Carini's in North Carolina. I like, um, like I say, it's a lot. Uh, the point, Warriors View. I mean, there's, there's really not like a bad restaurant, fortunately, in Warren County. So, yeah. And it sounds like y'all have got plenty of them because I know when I was there, there wasn't that many. There was a place that was very well known for its burgers and for their shakes, and that was like you were going to the. Yes. Heading out towards our cola and the armory, and I don't know if that place is still existing, but it was very popular for decades and several decades. But it was very popular, and everybody knew that you were going to go there to get your shakes and your burgers. Yep, Burger Barn. That's it. You from right. the Burger Barn? Like, yes, Burger Barn. They're they're still open. If that's who you're referring to, they're still open. They're still thriving. They're yes. You still have people like well. You can't cry it out in front of it anymore, but, you know, people are still showing up, getting the great burgers, getting the shakes, getting, you know, and they have a few extra items on the menu. You definitely got to try them out um, the next time you're in the area. I would definitely have to do that for sure. Now, what are you doing in terms of trying to create your own journalism career? Are you working with the newspaper there? Because I know there used to be the Warren Record way back when. I don't even know if it still exists or anything. Or are you looking at trying to break into either a newspaper or a TV radio market in, like, a big city, like New Jersey or New York, where uh, Dean is at? Or what is your own personal ambition in terms of media? Okay, well, um, the Warrenists is, it's my baby. I birthed it. You know, that was my, um, you know, that's really where my focus is right now. Um, the, yeah, and like you mentioned, the Warren Record is, it still exists. Um, but it, it, they have a print and they have like an online presence. I mm-hmm. solely want to focus on, on online, the digital. Um, I don't, at, at least right now, I don't have any interest in doing print um but as far as i want to definitely take like a multimedia um approach so that's where i'm going with that right now gotcha 
And how did you connect with Pat Murray? Like I said, I've known Pat Murray for a while, and she's got her own magazine, The Sky Writer, and is originally from Chicago, and then she's got her online version. But how did you make the connection to Pat, and how have y'all had that bond and everything? Because it seems like y'all have this media bond and everything, being ladies in the media. But I was just wondering how y'all connected and where that connection came from. Um, well, I first became familiar with Durham Skywriter. I was just looking for, let me see, what did I, I went to Google and I typed in, I think, like, online media, like, NC, local media, something like that, local media, NC media, online, something, it was some keywords like that. And I came across Durham Skywriter, and I said, oh, okay, this is me. I like this. This is, you know, something similar to what I envisioned for uh, the Warrenist. And so then, um, but I never reached out to her because I didn't know exactly how to approach her. And um, she actually was at an event at the Warren County Memorial Library with Howard Burchett. He was doing mm-hmm. a presentation on Marvin Gaye, I believe. I think it was Marvin Gaye. And so um, I just introduced myself and I said, hi. You know, I'm familiar with you because I recognize her face. And, you know, he introduced her. He was like, hey, she runs the Durham Skylight. I said, yeah, that's her, that's her. And so I just went up to her and said, hi, you know, I'm familiar with your work. And she gave me her information, and we've been chatting ever since, sharing ideas and, you know, learning about this whole online media business. Yeah, this is definitely a new and interesting business because, like I said, me and Dean have got this platform that we're using on radio, but I'm also part of something called the International Broadcast Media where they are literally creating a TV network and have got, I think, over 60 shows right now in, like, 122 countries, but they're using the Internet to create, like, basically what amounts to an Internet television network, and they're one of about four or five that I've heard that are doing this, and then there are some folks that are using it as platforms for their individual interests. Like this is my friend Mona Shakes that's out of California, and she's a Pakistani comedian, but she does a daily conversation about that and everything. So definitely we are seeing a number of people that are doing these things on a regular basis. So definitely I agree that online media is the wave of the future, and a lot of folks are starting to pay more attention to online media and all of that. And I think we heard a doorbell ringing. So, Dean, do we have somebody else at the door? Dean? Remember, I have to unmute my microphone, and it's about six steps you have to do from where I am. (laughs) But, yes, we have uh, Isabel Bart standing by. um, I would love to bring Isabel in. I think Isabel will enjoy this conversation. So don't go anywhere, Crystal, because I think Isabel will also enjoy this conversation as well, because Isabel did something really amazing, and who knows, maybe she'll even break out into song for us. But we're going to find out. So uh, bring Isabel into the conversation as well. Okay, Ms. Bars, welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Mark. You're now on the line. Well, hello there. Hello. How are you doing, Isabel? This is Mark, and that's Dean over there. We're actually on the line with Crystal, who has got a um, just did an amazing virtual event, and I know that you just released an amazing Christmas album. But she did an event around the holidays and everything, and uh, she's in Warren County, uh, North Carolina, and she's got a thing called the Warrenness, and she did a virtual holiday celebration. And Isabel, my friend Eric Barstow, so you know, a lot of my friends are telling me about all of you amazing yes. people, but Eric. Barstow was involved in some of the taping of your Christmas album because you just put out a Christmas album. And I was truly impressed with the fact that you were doing this during a pandemic. So if you'll share with me, Dean, and now Crystal, about this amazing album that you have put together and a little bit about your music career, because I know that you are based in Raleigh, if I remember correctly. And I would love to hear about how this whole thing came about and about your musical background. Because I think that um, you may even know the uh, cellist, that um, Crystal had, because he, apparently he's world famous, and apparently he's done things in Raleigh as well. So what was the name of that cellist yes. again, Crystal, the cellist that was involved in the, the production? And then I want to hear Isabel's story as to her Christmas album. But, uh, Crystal, if you could tell of the name of that cellist again, because apparently he lives in Warrington, but he plays all over. No, actually he doesn't live in Warrington. Um, he's out in Durham now. But his name is Carlos Bondellas. He used to teach at Warren County High School. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So you are, yes, I haven't so you are familiar? I haven't worked with him. I worked with another 
uh, cellist, Virginia Hudson, who uh, has since left the area, but I, I know him. Cool. Wonderful. So tell a little bit about um, your background and how you got involved in the music and also a little bit more about this particular CD that you put out that is so Christmas-oriented. Because like I said, as I was telling Crystal earlier, all of us are trying to find ways to pivot because we can't have the concerts that we used to have. And it sounds like this was your form of a pivot because you can't necessarily do the Christmas albums or you have to do them virtually. Like I know I was talking to Ira Davis Woods recently and usually folks would be rushing to go to see him do the Christmas Carol, but the Christmas Carol this year is also virtual. That's, that's correct. Um, uh, the, the idea for the album, the gift of Christmas, by Isabel and Friends uh, came to me because I know this is a difficult time for many people, and I thought we could transport ourselves back to the nostalgia of Christmas's past. And I started to formulate a list of songs that I would like to do and uh, started uh, with some of the traditional carols, uh, a Welsh air all through the night. And then we went into uh, Peace on Earth and Little Drummer Boy, which is a song performed by uh, David Bowie, actually, and uh, Bing Crosby many years ago. (laughs) And then I've uh, put in Coventry Carol and uh, Stille Nacht. I've got some... Uh, carols that are in in different languages, uh, German and English, for Silent Night, and uh, Bring a Torch, Jeanette Isabella, is in French and English as well. Gotcha. And uh, also tell our listeners, because we do have listeners from all over the world, a little bit about your musical background and how you got involved in music in general. So I'm sure that our folks would love to know about your background and also how you, long you've been performing and some of the folks that you performed with. So if you would share a little bit about your own musical background, I'm sure folks would love to hear about that. Okay. Um, well, I started singing uh, when I was very young, um, I was three years old, and I uh, was singing, and my mother thought I was screaming. And uh, her friend said to her, no, Pat, she's actually singing. And um, I was a a third culture kid. I was growing up in um, South Korea and uh, was actually born in in Japan. So. my experience with music was very much um, one of the popular songs that that were heard um, in these countries uh, as a little girl. I had no background in classical music other than hearing the London Symphony Orchestra and other um, sorts of composers and students that would come to the countries that my father was stationed in. He was there with the United States Embassy and uh, the exposure that I had to the classical world came by concerts and such. So I was singing um, in choirs and in a band and I decided that I wanted to be a voice major in college. And I auditioned at the University of Maryland, and uh, they accepted me into the program saying that I had a nice enough voice, but I was going to have to work very hard because of the lack of uh, background in music theory, music history, vocal diction, uh, music appreciation, all of that, and and not to mention all the foreign languages. So I uh, did uh, my program at the University of Maryland. Then I went on for a master's degree in vocal performance and a doctorate at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And um, I taught 
for many years. I taught at St. Augustine's College, now university, and at UNC Chapel Hill. And my uh, focus was my students and their recitals and their performances. And um, the idea for putting out my own record was that we're in this pandemic. I can't perform live. I can't be in front of a classroom teaching. So I'm um, doing everything virtually. And I wanted to keep uh, live performances um, as just that, alive. I wanted to keep particularly uh, classical music alive. So I have offered uh, custom-made songs on my website where if somebody wants to order, um, say, a, a performance of an aria or a performance of um, an art song or these uh, Christmas or folk songs, I will prepare it for them. And um, I have a website, isabelandfriends.com. And also I'm on YouTube. Thanks to uh, the wonderful work, Arsto. We did a we did a, a film of uh, all through the night, and um, I have just uh, put put a track on here yeah. by accident for you to listen. I do do that in the background, definitely. It sounds great. Oh, she's adjusting that. Well, anyway, oh, that, that happened yeah, that, by accident. No, no problem. Like I said, I was getting a little bit of that in the background and everything, but that's no problem at all. But I'm glad that you shared that website and everything. Now, uh, Crystal, since you're on and everything, what are some of your, and this is actually for both of you, but what are some of your favorite Christmas songs that you are a big-time fan of? Because like I said, a lot of folks are not able to go involved in celebrating Christmas, and that even means that a lot of folks are not going to be doing the caroling and things of that nature. So I was just wondering, some of your favorite songs to either sing or carol or even even think that you have a uh, good singing voice or not, Crystal, and then I want to hear the same thing from Isabel. But I'll start with you, Crystal. So what are some of your favorite songs to, to uh, listen to or to sing if you want to go out and sing them as a carol or whatever? Okay, well, first, no, I do not sing. <laughs> but um, well, I don't sing well. I'll say it like that. I don't sing well. But um, my probably, it doesn't feel like Christmas until I hear Silent Night by The Temptations. Like, that's oh, like. Oh, right. That, that, yeah, that's, the, that's my go-to. Like, I mean, I can hear, like, jingle bells and everything else, but. Until I hear Silent Night by the Temptations, it's not Christmas. Um, so let me see another song. Uh, Let It Snow by Boys the Men. Um, I love that one. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some others, but those are like the two for me. Yes. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And Isabel, what are some what are some of your classic songs that you love to perform and sing on a regular basis that might be the more classic traditional Christmas songs, but what are some of the ones that you enjoy either singing yourself or hearing? Well, I like this one, uh, Peace on Earth, as a duet with Little Drummer Boy and uh, Coventry Carol and this um, All Through the Night. Uh, which I put on the album. Um, there's there's so much in the way of um, choir music that you can just get together and sing. And uh, Crystal, don't worry about your singing voice. The the whole point is the joy of singing. Yeah, well, a lot it's, of it's not bringing joy to anyone if they hear me sing. So. <laughs> well, it might it might make bring a smile anyway. 
<laughs> I hear you. Um, I, love, I love the Pentatonics. The Pentatonics have done um, some great Christmas music, and um, Josh Groban and uh, Michael Bublé. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, have yourself a merry little Christmas and the Christmas song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are some classic Christmas songs and everything. I know before you came on, Isabel, um, Crystal was sharing about her virtual event, and it did feature a uh, famous uh, confectionery that's up there in Warren County as well. And they were talking about, like, the sweet dish that they had put together as well as this gentleman that is a chef, and he was putting one of his food dishes out there. So do you have any favorite Christmas dishes that you're always involved in around Christmas, Isabel? And I'm going to ask the same question to Crystal because, like I said, we were talking about what was on the tape, but I want to know whether she has any personal ones as well. But I'm going to come to you first, Isabel. Are there any favorite dishes that you always have to have in order for you to even think that it's that Christmas spirit, much in the way that Crystal was talking about those particular songs? Well, I love um, these cookies. Uh, They're called Snickerdoodles, and they're a cinnamon-coated sugar cookie. I like... um, the the Yule log I I literally made a church choir member uh, make a Yule log for me um, in exchange for my singing for the Sunday school concert and um, she she is a professional quality baker and um, I I don't know if you're familiar with it but it's a it's a roll cake that's uh, has a chocolate filling and then uh, chocolate shavings on top, and it's it's a French um, concoction and it's just fantastic. Uh, I also um, am one of those people who who likes fruit cake. Some people think there's only one fruit cake in the world, and it's being passed among all of us. But I I do happen to like fruit cake. And what about any regular kind of dishes that aren't in the sweet uh, field or anything of that nature? Yes, I've named all the sweets. Um, I like um, to have uh, turkey on uh, Christmas Day, and um, I love the uh, like a breakfast casserole, an egg egg casserole. Wow. What about you, Crystal? And then. Um, answer that and then the question I'll ask both of y'all as well is your favorite Christmas memory so definitely go with the food and then you can also go into the Christmas memories and then Isabel I'll come back to you on the Christmas memories but uh, what are some of your favorite foods other than your friend's uh, dish that you were talking about because I'm sure that's on your list but what are some of the other favorite sweets and uh, dishes that you are a big time fan of when it comes to Christmas okay oh gosh when it comes to Christmas um, I would yeah. say, and it actually kind of ties with the um, Christmas memory. Um, huh? it was, and again, it's the cookies that we're talking about. Um, uh, there was like sugar cookies, and then you had the icing, and then there was like these little sugar crystals that you would sprinkle on top. I guess that's what they're called. Mm. I don't know. I just know when I see them, and I guess that that you know together. Um, is my favorite, but the, and it also reminds me of my childhood, of, you know, the night before Christmas and, you know, sprinkle these little sugar crystal sprinkles or whatever they were um, on top. And so just, you know, taking that back, and I have two children of my own, and that is something that um, I really want to incorporate, you know, into our, you know, just, you know, continue the tradition. Um, so yeah, I would say that's probably my my favorite, and that's because of the memory that's attached. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And before I get to Isabel's memories and everything, I don't know if you heard the conversation or the chatter that was going on as you were doing your virtual event, but I know both myself and uh, Pat Murray and I think one or two other people were talking about the fact that whenever you had those big times desserts, there was always that bad habit of the kids definitely uh, wanting to do the cleaning because you knew you were going to clean off the um, sweet stuff the off spatula. of the spatula and, and all of that. So we were having this whole conversation about you, know, you wanted that job because you know you're going to get the extra sweet stuff off of the spatula. 
Right, not realizing how bad it is for us, but we're just eating it up. <laughs> yeah, no. I, yeah, I saw those, yeah. It totally was not good for us, but then again, you know, those whole kind of like um, snow cream was using the elements of snow and whatever was out there oh, in the, yeah. the uh, sand and the earth. So that probably wasn't good for us either. So there's probably a couple of things that we did in winter that weren't good for us because I know that I was definitely a fan of trying to create snow ice cream, and that was definitely involving whatever fell out of the sky and everything else. So there probably was all kinds of bad elements in those things that we were digesting. But when you're a kid, you're digesting is probably a lot better than it is as an adult. But, Isabel, what are some of your pleasant Christmas memories? Well, um, there, there are many. Um, one was um, taking my sister and um, her children to Disney World. And instead of doing uh, presents, we had Christmas at Disney World and uh, taking a a five and a six year old to di- to Disney is just it is magical. Um, not to be cliched, but I that was my favorite Christmas. Yeah, I can definitely see where that would be and, interesting. Yeah. I can, yeah. I, I can see where that would definitely be fun and everything. I do remember going to Disney World. It was actually just to date myself again. It was um, I don't think it was around Christmas, but it was around the time that Elvis passed away and I was actually with my grandma. So me and my younger brother oh, were with wow. grandma. We went, to, we went to Disney World and I remember when we came back, we saw that um, the announcement had been made about Elvis having passed. So that was probably in the 70s or something like that. And I just remember that announcement yeah. coming across the screen and we had been at Disney the whole time, hanging out with Mickey Mouse. So I do know that we would it switched everybody's focus and everything as we were watching the uh, news and of course this was the internet wasn't as big so it was all on the regular TV and all of that so I definitely remember that incident when my uh, grandma Molly was living because we had just been down to Florida to the Disney that you're talking about and everything because Disney World is down there and Disneyland is in California right so I hope we get those mix up all these different Disney's, uh, Disney properties that are out yeah. there but yeah the definitely Park. can relate to that Definitely can relate to that thought and everything because I remember when my grandma was living that that happened and we were visiting. I remember one of the things about that was that, um, well, and I'm not saying I'm the bravest person even now, but I was definitely not, I had a little bit probably more braveness then and my brother's got plenty of braveness, but grandma was not getting any of those rides, particularly when she saw a ride that was literally going up to the top and then like stopping and then they would let you finish it. So she oh. saw that, and I think my brother was trying to talk her into going, and she's looking at it like, nope, not happening. Y'all have fun up there. Yeah. I'll see y'all when y'all come back down, but not happening. I'm not going on that trip. <laughs> so she she was alive long enough to have some sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, definitely had that sense and everything. Uh, what are you I was going to talk about? You said that you had gone to um, and taught at UNCG and Central. And like I said earlier, that definitely we're seeing more virtual events, kind of like what Crystal did and everything. And we're even seeing that in the music business and everything. But what is it about North Carolina? I asked earlier, Crystal, what it is about Warrington. Say it is um, so attractive to her about that particular town. But I was wondering if you could talk about what is it about North Carolina? Because we were talking about Brooke Simpson, who is from Warren County, but definitely is there. And we have some rich musical schools. You mentioned a couple of them. Like I said, I know UNCG's got a great musical school. North Carolina Central's got a great musical school. Um, I've actually had a uh, acquaintance of mine whose daughter, Genevieve Palmer, was actually one of the violinists there at UNCG for a number of years, and now she's in some other bands. I think she goes by Sinclair Palmer now. But what are some of the uh, yes. things about North Carolina that make it so uh, rich to you and so uh, wonderful in terms of being supportive of our music community? Because yes. I think we have some great music education here in North Carolina. I I find the culture here, there's a tremendous um, art scene, excellent ballet company, and uh, the North Carolina Symphony, um, the UNC uh, School of the Arts. A lot of the graduates from there go directly to work for for Disney. They go to Broadway. Uh, there, there's just 
a tremendous amount of talent. And I moved here from New York City and have been uh, very pleased with the amount of live music and live entertainment here. Yeah, definitely. Um, have you been keeping in touch with any of your friends in New York City? Because I know that there was a very rich Broadway community there in New York, but unfortunately it's my understanding that they're going to be shut down possibly for the rest of 2021. I think the last I heard was September, but there's speculation it could be all through 2021 as we try to get this whole vaccine situation. But are you still in touch with your friends in the industry there, and what are they telling you about which way we're heading in terms of being able to get out and do live events? I I have a friend who uh, plays in the pit for uh, Hamilton uh, prior to the pandemic, and she literally doesn't think that uh, Broadway is they, – they originally had wanted to come back in January, but as you said, they're now coming back in September, and um, she's doing something completely different to earn a living, so – it's very, very hard. Yep, yeah, I agree. It's very, very, very hard. hard. And a, lot of, a lot of people are doing different things. Like what Crystal was doing is the virtual concerts. Have you done a lot of, Isabel, have you done a lot of virtual concerts and things along those lines? And how have you found those as a, um alternative to the live performance? Because I know that you musicians love live performances. I've emceed festivals, and I know I prefer the live versus emceeing the virtual ones. I mean, I will definitely emcee a virtual one. Crystal, if you need another MC, I'm available. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no problem. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know that he's on standby, Crystal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <Okay. laughs> um, but seriously, I, Isabel, how have you enjoyed? I mean, have you done the virtual events, and how are they working for you in terms of like doing these kind of uh, concerts, or do you? find that you're not having as much success with them. I'd love to hear your take on it as a musician. I'm I'm doing some concerts um, using Zoom, uh, but they're mostly for friends. I, I literally have just released this album December 4th, so my entire focus has been on that, but I would like to uh, be promoting virtual concerts and um, there's certainly some venues available Uh, mandolin is a local uh, venue for artists who want to put on virtual concerts so they've actually got the whole stage and the whole virtual setup because i wasn't even familiar with them and everything and you said it's called mandolin mandolin yes and uh the blue note in new york I've been watching their virtual concerts. Uh, Deepak was putting on some virtual concerts. And uh, even the uh, North Carolina Ballet. Yeah, because I noticed that um, one of the places I work at is uh, the Hey Ty Heritage Center, and I know they've done some virtual concerts, and I also know that uh, North Star Church of the Arts, which is kind of like the uh, passion project for um, Phil Freelon before he uh, – passed away, which, of course, his um, son, Pierce, and his um, wife, uh, Nina, yeah. are still very much involved in, along with Heather and Phil Cook, but they've done quite a few virtual concerts, including some that I think featured uh, Shana Tucker and a number of other local musicians yeah. from around this area. So it's yeah. been good seeing them and everything. How, as an artist, and this is actually for both of you, but do you feel that you're getting enough support from the community as well as from even the local government and the national government in terms of, like, having survivability things and things along that line? Because I do know that sometimes there's been conversations around whether artists are getting enough release money and support and things of that nature. But as as a practicing artist, and you, Crystal, as one that's doing the blog, do you feel that you're getting the kind of support that you would like, or do you still have to do the old tip jar methods of getting the money and the support? So how are you feeling that you're the – um, both the state and the local and the federal government is doing in terms of giving you the kind of support that you need because unfortunately artists and restaurants are usually the ones that are hit the hardest and I know even in the restaurant business I've heard estimates that as many as 60% could go under if they're not given some sort of major um, stimulus or major 
infusion of cash. Did you want Crystal to respond first? Or? It, 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 you go first, Isabel, and then I'll get Crystal's response. It, it, it's it's very difficult. There There isn't a lot of support. I, uh, you can get unemployment if you're um, working full time, but I, I've heard stories of people waiting, you know, for over four months for the first unemployment check. So um, it, it's a very tough time, and, and people are putting on virtual concerts uh, and uh, using their savings, frankly. You know, I, I don't know uh, musicians who are really um, earning a living um, unless you're teaching full time. Who are, yeah, who are able that. to earn a living from the arts. So. That's a shame. Crystal, what's your take on that? That was actually one of the things that surprised me even about your holiday gathering was on some of these things I've seen them incorporate, um, what do you call them, like um, uh, auctions and things of that nature or do some sort right. of fundraising element. And I did not see that with what you did, Crystal. So that actually surprised me. Or maybe I just happened to miss that element. But, uh, Crystal, what are your thoughts about um, th- whether there's enough support or things of that nature? Because, like I said, that's one of the things that I was surprised that I didn't see on the virtual holiday gathering was any sort of, like, what I called online tip jar or any sign of that kind of support that was out there along those lines. So I know that definitely – the, even the Eno and Centerfest did like an online auction at the same time they were doing the concert. Right, right. And, um, well, when I originally um, thought of this idea to do it, I said I wanted this to be a gift for to right. the community because they had been supporting me. It wasn't in a financial, me- financial means, but it had been supporting me as far as, like, helping me get the word out, um, so they were backing me um, with word of mouth, uh, with promotion in that way. And so what ended up happening actually with the festival is that people reached out to me privately to say, hi, is there any way I can support you? Can I donate? And so I was able right. to do that. I was like, you know, even though that wasn't the initial plan, you know, it happened because they would see what I did, you know, prior to the event, and they knew the amount of work that went into it. And so they're like, well, let me help you with this. And, you know, it was a financial donation. Um, But also with this festival, um, we were talking about Carlos um, Bardellas earlier. Um, That's his entertainment. His segment was sponsored by the Warren County Arts Council. So that was at least some sort of assistance um, with the festival. Gotcha. And I think you yeah, have other sponsors. Go ahead, Isabel. The German, or the German Durham Arts Council, of course, and the North Carolina Council for the Arts are doing what they can to uh, fund the, the special events, um, the the North Carolina Opera has just put on uh, opera in the park, and uh, they're receiving funding to put on those concerts. Um, but I would say the the independent artist is um, struggling. I I'm being um, supported because my friends are um, and and followers are buying my CDs, so yeah, definitely understand that's that. how they are contributing. And, gotcha. And um, I want to get to um, back to how you know Eric, but before I get to that, I want to get to Crystal on something that just popped into my mind and everything, which is how is things going in terms of like um, – because like you said earlier, everybody's at their home, whether they're living in New York, New Jersey, Raleigh, Durham, or Warrington. But are you finding that folks are actually following the rules according to what they should be doing in those more rural areas like Warren County? Or is there some resistance there as well, like there have been in other parts of the country? Is everybody pretty much cooperating? And also, how is it impacting the farm industry? Because Warren County is a rural town, and it's definitely a very 
farm oriented town, even though, like you said, there's a lot of stuff that's developing in the city proper or in the town proper. But I was just wondering how the pandemic is impacting that population in general, the population of Warren County in general. So the rural North Carolina and uh, Southern Virginia area, for those that are listening globally, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts as to how things are going in terms of people following the rules or not following the rules or actually doing what they should be doing and whether cases have been spiking or not spiking or what you've heard in my former hometown of Warren County. Okay. Well, um, for the most part, um, people are um, observing the, you know, the three W's, at least the majority, I'll say that. Um, But as far as, like, Warren County in comparison to um, adjacent counties, we are doing fairly well. Uh, We have seen uh, an uptick of numbers um, um, in the last, I'm going to say, last two or three weeks. And I would say that is because, you know, with the holidays and, you know, just people being tired of being in the house and wanting to go out. Um, but for the most part, I mean, you do see, you know, a few people here and there with no mask or, um, you know, just doing whatever. But for the most part, we're doing fairly well, like I said, in comparison to other areas. Um, and as far as the farming industry goes, um, to my understanding, um, some have partnered with, like, um, nonprofit organizations and local restaurants, um, and they're offering like farm to table options. Um, uh, we have uh, one particular farmer um, in mind, um, Brown Family Farms. Um, he's gotten really creative um, with farming. He was offering like these produce boxes because I know I went and got two of them, and they mm. were fantastic. Yes, they were fantastic. And, um, <laughs> And so, you know, just offering these tours and just being able to, um, um, like we say, pivot, you know, with what's going on. So um, that's how they're handling Of course, everyone has taken a hit. The farmers have taken a hit. But um, from what I've observed, several of them are, you know, learning to adjust or find another means to make it work. That makes sense. And Isabel, Speaking of pivot, I'm going to pivot again. But Isabel, tell, tell folks about how you connected with Eric. Because like I said, I've known Eric is this truly amazing filmmaker and things of that nature. But like I said, when I saw him mentioning that you had this CD out, I was like, well, I need to reach out to Isabel and see if she's available to be on the show. Because I've known Eric, he's always got some really, truly amazing things in the film world. But I was just wondering how you made that connection. And also, my other question for you is a little bit of, we talked earlier about the arts community, but I would love to know, how you've adjusted from moving from New York to the Raleigh area. Because like I said, you're still in the city, but it's much different than New York. I know that for a fact. So like I said, it's a two-part <laughs> question. But the first yeah. part is, Eric, is, how did you meet Eric and how did that connection come? And then the second part would be, how did you make that adjustment from New York and the big city lights down to Raleigh and the smaller city lights? Okay. Uh, I met Eric through my colleague, Ellen Shepard, who was the film studies professor at St. Augustine's University. And uh, he is a former student of hers. And I worked with him on another video, uh, a tour guiding video for the city of Raleigh. And he did such a great job on that that I wanted to use him also for the music video. And he's, as you know, very active at the film studies department at Duke. And he also uh, runs a summer teen uh, film workshop. And uh, I I wanted to give Eric a plug. I sent his music video, Sound of L.A., my publicist, expecting them to send it back to me and say, let's tweak this and make some changes here and there. And they just loved it. Uh, So they put it on YouTube um, the way he had done it without making any changes. So 
He's he's uh, a just a gem. He's a gem of a person. No, no doubt about that. And tell us a little bit about the uh, move from New York to here and how you made that adjustment, because I know sometimes those adjustments can be cultural shocks. I actually was talking earlier on my streaming podcast to a friend of mine that some 20 years ago made the opposite uh, adjustment. He moved from the uh, town of, well, first he moved from Hillsborough to D.C., where he has family at and that whole D.C., uh, northern Virginia area, and then he moved from there all the way out to California, where he's been for the last 20 years plus working in the Hollywood industry. So definitely I've seen folks make these pivots, and sometimes it can be interesting in how they react and make the pivots. So how did you make the pivot, and how did it work in, for, when you coming from the New York where all those opportunities are, well, they have been before the pandemic, yes. to coming down yes. here? I lived in New York City for 10 years, and uh, I came down here because I wanted to go back to school. I had been working in banking, and I wanted to go back to school and uh, get my doctorate in vocal performance. And UNCG had some instructors that I wanted to work with, um, so the the adjustment, though, moving from New York City to Greensboro at the time was a, a huge adjustment for me. I came down here because I have family uh, living here. My parents had retired and my sister uh, had gone to Wake Forest and was um, the director of health services at the School of the Arts and uh, they were encouraging me to come down and, and have the entire family together. And um, when I first moved to Greensboro, I uh, walked too fast down the street. And when I went, walked into a store, my approach was not um, casual. Uh, you kind of need to slow down and, and ask people how they're doing and um, <laughs> make some uh, small talk before you make your purchase. And uh, coming from Manhattan, it was, it was a case of, of somebody who's, who um, does everything too quickly. So uh, I, I did, I did, find it a challenge to to adjust to um the uh the southern um kind of slower slower pace um and certainly at the time anyway um from from Manhattan and I'm sure you can relate to what I'm talking about. Yeah, definitely. I was, one of the questions I was going to ask Crystal was if she's ever had this pleasure of traveling to the bigger cities like New York or D.C. or Atlanta and having what I would call the opposite effect, having grown up in like <laughs> a very rural town and a very kind of like quiet town, which has all kinds of wonderful features and definitely a rich artistic community of its own. But definitely I'm thinking that if you've ever visited those bigger cities, you might have had that opposite effect, similar to what my friend that went from Hillsboro to um, Virginia and now is making it a big time as a producer in L.A. But I was just wondering, Crystal, if you've had those kind of experiences and how did you cope with them on the opposite side of what Isabel was just describing? Oh, well, I've never, other than Raleigh, uh, which you know is still a huge difference between Warrington and Raleigh. Mm -hmm. um, now, I have visited other places, but as far as live there, no. But it is quite a... Uh, culture shock. You know, it's like everyone is on the move and I'm like, where is everyone going? And, and so with Warrington, you know, <laughs> it's a very homey feel. It's very um, laid back, relaxed. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a difference um, in living. It's something that I had to um, learn quickly um, to keep up. But, um, but, yeah, so have I ever thought about living other places? I have. Um, will I do it? Maybe one day, but I'm, I'm liking it in Warrington for right now. <laughs> 
that makes a lot of sense. And <laughs> Isabel, how do you think that you would you said to move into Raleigh would be an interesting experience? I can only imagine what it would be like if you moved to like one of these what I call like rural towns or bedroom communities or things of that nature. So if you've ever gone that far to the other side of like the very quiet kind of communities and did that take you even further down the path of like it being totally different from Manhattan and everything? Uh I have a story to tell you. I was house sitting in Pilot Mountain. And okay. Pilot Mountain is the exact opposite of New York City. And I moved um, via Pilot Mountain to Greensboro because I was house sitting for my sister. And she has chickens and llamas and goats and alpacas and at the time she had uh, angora rabbits and um, from this high rise living I was living on the 27th floor uh, near the Lincoln Center to Pilot Mountain and um, the the tune that kept going through my head was Green Acres. Um, I don't know if you remember that old. I, I remember show. Green Acres, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, it it was um, so so quiet that it was alarming for me. I was used to hearing uh, the city noises. Um, sirens and people talking and at at night you would hear absolutely nothing and I found myself um, up at for a couple of nights at least because of the um, the total shocking silence uh, out um, now I adore it it's it's so beautiful and um, pastoral and, and, and comforting. But at the time, I was a big city girl. And, and uh, I thought I'd, you know, move to the outer limits. <laughs> thought you moved to the outer limits, like the old space show yeah. and everything. Definitely, I can relate yeah. to yeah. folks right. having that kind of attitude and everything. So definitely, that would be a different kind of environment for folks to be involved in and all of that. I was just wondering, um, because we talk a, lot, a little bit of everything here on this show and everything. So I'd love to hear both of y'all's perception, and then I'm going to bring Dean into the conversation because I'm sure he's got some thoughts about living in the big cities and small cities. But what, how do you feel the country is going in terms of, like, both the fight against the pandemic but also in terms of, like, our conversations around race relations and things of that nature? So I'd love to hear from both of y'all because I know that even in Warren County there used to be, when I was there, we had – three homecoming queens, and I don't know if that's still the case, but way, way back then in the 80s, there was one that was intentionally picked to be the African-American one, the Native American one, and there was one that was a white homecoming queen. Of course, this was in the 70s, so hopefully things have gotten much better than they were during that time and everything, but I'd just love to hear your thoughts and everything, Crystal, and also which way you feel the country is going, because that is something that is on a lot of people's minds, and I'd love to hear Isabel's perception as well. But I'll start with you, Crystal. Okay, well, my thoughts about, well, as far as here in Warren County, um, we had a, you know, a major move um, earlier this summer, mm. and what is that we um, removed a Confederate statue off of the courthouse square, and so that was huge, and um, during that time, like, I, I, um, I did a Facebook Live of them actually taking the statue down. And during that, I could read the comments of, you know, how people felt. You know, people were celebrating, and then there were people who were angry that it was being removed. And so during the whole summer, mm-hmm. well, you know, with George Floyd and everything, and then um, people viewing Black Lives Matter in a, a new light, you know, it was one of those, like, uh, see, this is what we were trying to say, you know, that kind of thing. Um, 
I think with the pandemic, what it did, it made people realize what was important and what was not. Um, and I think what it is is teaching us, um, well, we're we're seeing things in a different light. We're seeing, you know, a layer was removed. Um and people are revealing the true selves. I'll say it like that. Um, but as far as the direction that we're going in, I believe there are more, I'm not going to say woke, but I think there are more people who are aware of what's going on. And you have more people who are willing to do something about it, who are more vocal now. Um and so as far as we going into um, 2021, am I hopeful? I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say yes, um, because, you know, with the change of um, leadership, I think that's going to help. It's going to take time, I know, but um, I'm staying positive. And that's that's how I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna leave that question. <laughs> that, that makes sense. What about you, Isabel? What is your take on both the pandemic and race relations, and also just how we're doing in terms of the direction of the country? Kind of like I framed it to Crystal, but I'd love to hear your perception as well. It's one that's also spent some time in New York, where certain people came from. Yes, and and the pandemic has forced us to confront the the issues around racism in this country and um it we are going through growing pains we are having uh a lot of um rather painful um dialogue and um painful uh splits even even among family members, um, there's there's difficulty um, talking about the the state of the country now. I find I feel though that with the new administration, there is very good reason to be hopeful. Um, I I do say, though, that there's an absolute necessity for us to come together and work together. Uh, there was still a tremendous uh, divide in the vote, which was shocking to me that um, there was uh, so much of a, a voting population for um, the current administration, you know. So um, I, I'm hopeful. I'm able to have uh, frank conversations now with um, my African-American friends, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, so that makes a lot of I, sense. I've, yeah, I feel that in – in 2021, we have a ton of work to do, uh, but uh, the democracy is is winning. The the principles that the founding fathers put in place are winning out. So. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on that and everything. As one that spends all that time in New York, were you shocked at that? person that's currently in the uh, White House still has the amount of support that he had, because I was truly shocked, and I know friends of mine that actually worked in New York that did not expect it to be that many votes and everything, and did not expect it to be as close as apparently it was. So as one that is a former New Yorker and probably even might have even had some dealings with folks that would have worked in his buildings and everything, were you as a former New Yorker, shocked by the amount of folks that are still supportive of that current person that's in 1600. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm 
disheartened that uh, North Carolina has uh, gone for him. Um, But I'm not entirely surprised. I'll just say that. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. As a New Yorker, yes, it's it's, uh, fathomable that that we would reelect somebody who at this point um, has has helped to um, what what is it over two hundred and eighty thousand now two hundred and eighty three thousand people have lost their lives yeah that's real sad and it keeps rising and everything so hopefully this vaccine will come around and we can start getting that healing process that y'all were talking about because I definitely think that this the healing that is definitely needed and everything so I agree with y'all on that and everything and definitely uh, I would agree that we've got to move in a more positive direction and to have things along those lines so I would definitely agree that uh, that I was shocked but uh, you were talking about North Carolina well I love North Carolina and I definitely love the different cities that I've been in like Durham, like Warrington, like a number of others. Yeah. I even lived recently in Greensboro and Raleigh and have relatives in Charlotte, but um, and other cities around the area. Mom lived in Winston-Salem, so there's been a number of places that I've had connections to, but I sometimes say that North Carolina is probably one of the, and you all two may get a kick out of this because I've even said it publicly to some friends of mine, it's probably one of the most schizophrenic states that exists because we're the same state that elected, for those that know history, Jesse Helms and Terry Sanford. <laughs> elected Roy Cooper and Pat McCurry. Mm-hmm. So like I said, we've always had this history of slightly being a little schizophrenic in which way we decide to go, whether it's a little bit to the uh, <clears throat> side that I'm a pro- prefer, which is more of the liberal to moderate kind of sides of like Sanford and uh, McCrory, or then we sometimes go on the far right side like Jesse Helms and Matt, Pat McCrory. So like I said, I've always found us to be a slightly schizophrenic state. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the word. You've chosen a good word for it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would yeah. definitely agree with that and everything. It's just an interesting state and it has some interesting values and all of that. But on a uh, lighter note, um, Isabel, for folks that are, and this is, I'm going to frame it in another way for you, Crystal, but for those that are thinking about getting into the music field, whether it's now when we're in the middle of a pandemic era or things along that line, what kind of words of advice would you give to folks that want to break into any form of the um, creative arts, whether it's music, whether it's um, trying to do, like you mentioned, some people that were doing the ballet and a number of other things, but anybody that wanted to get involved in the creative arts, what kinds of words of advice would you give to them in order to encourage them to do what they're doing, and what kinds of things would you say they should be doing? Of any age, because like I said, I think that people can even break into the fields at a later age. You don't have to do it necessarily when you're 20. I've known folks that have broken into the business when they were in their 40s and 50s, whatever that business is. Exactly. Well, the pandemic is going to end, and we will have live music again. We will fill the theaters with audiences, and um, there's good reason for uh, there to be many jobs in the music industry. So I would encourage anyone who wants to go into music and feels it's a a calling that they should do it. I I would recommend going in with uh, both eyes wide open and uh, maybe uh, not doing it as a uh, profession where you pay your your bills with it, but that you do it um, in the evenings or uh, do it as a hobby and then see see how it goes. Uh, there are many, many um, dentists and lawyers and doctors and people from all kinds of professions who have the enjoyment of their music, but they're not uh, paying their bills with it. So that would be my advice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of folks were also doing 
the church gigs in order to develop their musical skills and things of that nature. But yeah. even some of those are still going on, whether it's virtually, because I do know some friends of mine that are at Christ Central and a number of these other churches that are still playing, but they're doing virtual concerts and in some cases or virtual services. And in some cases, the virtual services also include the bands and uh, some of the musical element as well. But in some cases, I also think that they might have scaled down some of the bands. So if it was a big full Required because of the limitations of size, then they might have scaled down based on whatever the restrictions are. But I definitely think that the church uh, groups are a way to go. As a matter of fact, Crystal, one of my yeah. good friends who I think is still involved in the music industry there in Warren County is um, Steve Hyman, and I know he was a gospel DJ or still is a gospel yeah. DJ, but he also plays right. in bands, and we grew up together and. Uh, He's actually a little bit older than me, but was still involved in that area, but is also involved in a, one of the churches there. Isn't that correct, Crystal? Isn't he involved with one of the churches there in Warren County? I believe so. I would have to check on it. But, yeah, he's, he's definitely a big name in Warren County. It's not too many yeah. people you would meet that doesn't know him. So Right. <laughs> And I, I thought mm-hmm. he was one of those names along with, like, Stanley Baird, because a lot of people know that Stanley was another music teacher, even though he's based here in Durham. But a lot of people know him because he taught there in Warren County for a number of years. And, of course, he's played with a lot of bands here in this area. So I'm thinking that he's still got a pretty good name there in the Warren County area as well. Is that correct, Crystal? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, folks definitely okay. know yeah. Stanley. <laughs> and everything. But my question for you, Crystal, is what kind of advice if somebody want to break into the world? Maybe they live in a town similar to Warrington and they want to start their own blog or things of that nature. What kind of advice would you give to them? Like I said, you're doing kind of what Pat Murray is doing here in Durham with the Skywriter and a number of other people have done. I think there's a blog called Bull City something, Bull City 150, I think it is, or something along those lines. But there are actually a couple of Bull City blogs. But if folks are in their rural towns and they want to be involved, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, I would say do it because you want to, but don't do it for the money Um, because it is a small area. It is a rural area. Um, Like I said, I started, really I started the Warren is because I wanted an outlet to write. You know, that's something that I really enjoy doing. And that's, uh, well, writing and photography. And so it really grew into what it is now. But um, my advice would be to, you know, figure out why, figure out your why. You know, why are you doing Mm -hmm. this? Um, What's your purpose? For me also, it was about um, I saw a lot of things that were going on in the community that wasn't getting any type of attention. I mean, like, just like great things. There was a guy here who organized um, an event for um, breast cancer and domestic violence, almost like no attention, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's where the ideas start going. I'm like, I want to write. What do I want to write about? Um, So, yeah, that would be my advice is finding your why. Um, Because if you go into it strictly for money, you're going to lose interest very quickly. Um, and yep. I would tell people to become acquainted with social media um, <laughs> because without it, I mean, you you almost, I, I, case, I hate to say it, but you don't exist, you know, if you don't have <laughs> it as far as like a business standpoint. Um, and I would tell people, you know, just become familiar with the tools and the platforms that are out there. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was really good. Um, along those same lines, Isabel, and I'm going to come back to what Crystal just said, is there in the music industry or just in your own, like, area of Raleigh, is there a news story that you feel is being underreported or not reported at all? So it's interesting that Crystal brought that example up because I know that on my streaming platform, Steve Rao had a couple of folks from around the world talk about things that folks might not be hearing because of the pandemic and everything else blowing up the news cycle so much that we're not hearing everything that should be covered. And um, so I was just wondering, is there something in the music industry or just in general that you think folks should know more about that you're hearing on the ground, but you're not hearing enough of people talking about it? Well, we, we did have um, a downtown Raleigh boarded up after 
protests. There were peaceful protests during the day, and then there were um, uh, not so peaceful protests at night. And some of the businesses are still boarded up and have not come back. And um, I would like to see that uh, change. I'd like to see those small mom and pop businesses return. Um, as far as the the music business, there there are some uh, rock bands that are that are. Are you there? That was just our ten minute warning. Yeah, that was just our ten minute warning. But go ahead. You think there are some rock bands? So rock bands are um, popping up and uh, getting record deals. Uh, I was very pleased to find a, a high caliber recording studio here in Raleigh. I'm, you know, very satisfied. I didn't need to go to um, New York or Los Angeles. It's it's right here. So um, I, I think I think you need to be aware that all the the major cities in North Carolina have world class musicians and world class talent and uh they they may not be known nationally but they're they're certainly here. You know, not everyone is a Nina Freelon but uh they're certainly here throughout North Carolina. No, I would definitely agree with you on that. And like you said, there are all kinds of different genres. I'm friends with uh, Kim Register, who runs a number of bands, including Loomland and uh, Midtown Dickens, and runs that nightclub, The Pinhook, in Durham. So definitely she's got yes. a full with a number of things. And, of course, she's definitely from this area, and Megaphone is from here. And there's a number of other great bands. I want to say that even, uh, like um, I mentioned earlier, St. Clair Palmer, and there's a number of other groups that are definitely coming out throughout the area. So you're right, there is a very rich musical tradition here in the Durham area, some that are names that are known nationally and even internationally, and then there's those that are just known locally and everything of that nature. And like we were talking about earlier, even there in Warren County, we've got Brooke Simpson, who's actually in that general area, as well as um, some other rising stars that are trying to find their niche. So I do agree that there's always some great talent. So, Crystal, is there anybody talent-wise that we should be looking for from Warren County? And I've, since I made my own personal plug earlier, I think that your next event, you need to have Isabel come and perform for the next virtual uh-huh. whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, Happy but, yeah, as far as, like, local talent, um, I would definitely say the Mills kids, the ones that were in the beginning of the virtual festival. Um, Jaden and I'm sorry, Jada and Jalen Mills. Um, they were part of the. They actually went to Showtime at the Apollo. They went um, on the show I, that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And so, yeah, they performed at the um, Falling for the Holidays Virtual Festival. Um, I would say they're definitely just some to watch. Also, um, Almeida Wortham. She um, actually sung for Oprah Winfrey. Um, this was maybe about, what, two years ago? So, I mean, we have some definitely some mm. heavy hitters in our area. Sounds like it. Definitely always some great heavy hitters in the different communities that everybody lives at and everything. One of the things I try to do on all the shows that I do, whether it's the ones on the International Broadcast Media Network or the one on this audio network that me and Dean have created, is I try to give folks a chance to give their words of encouragement, their words of positivity that they would like to share with the folks that are listening. And sometimes these folks are all over the world and everything of that nature. So I'll start with you, Isabel, and then come to Crystal. But what kind of – then I'll grab – Dean and everything, but what kinds of words of encouragement would you like to share with the world just in general, or words of positivity? So I'll start with you, Isabel, and then come to you, Crystal. Well, my words are the music in you. Keep the music in lo- alive throughout your life, and uh, whatever your passion is, that's keeping the music in you. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What about you, Crystal? What kind of words of thought or positivity would you like to share with our global audience and the folks that are listening that you would like them to know and to think about in a positive light? Um, well, something that I think about for myself and um, hopefully it can help others is that don't let your surroundings determine your outcome. Um, yes, this mm-hmm. is a, it's a small area. This is a rural area. Um, work locally, but think globally. That's the way I look at things. So that's no. why I'm taking, you know, the virtual route, um, you know, being able to reach people um, that I wouldn't ordinarily um, had it not been for Facebook and other social media platforms. Along those same lines, and before I bring Dean in, what's the craziest place that you've heard somebody reach out to you on the wireless and everything? Like, have you had somebody from, like, some global place that you were not expecting either to call you, email you, or something like that? And can you reflect on what that place was or what that memory was of somebody that might have reached you after they read your blog or after they saw the Facebook posts? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think where they were from. I believe they were from France. Um, yeah, I believe they were from France. I'm trying to remember what the post was about. But, I mean, it wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't like a any type French-related post. It was just, it was positive post about, so I can't remember what it was. It was maybe last year sometime, um, gotcha. and I was just sharing good news. And they were like, <laughs> you know, greetings from France. I'm like, okay, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And Isabel, on those same lines, but slightly different, if you could, uh, if you had a dream place to go perform, where would that be? So like I said, if you had uh, your dream place, you came from New York, you're now in Raleigh, you're taught in Greensboro, but is there some place that you haven't performed that you would love to perform at some point or another? I'm sure you've played in all kinds of places, and we're definitely there in the heart of the life in New York, but what's the dream place that you haven't gone that's on your dream list? Oh, gosh. Um, Carnegie Hall. I've I've sung in the back studios of Carnegie Hall, but that would be, that would be a, a big moment <laughs> to sing at Carnegie Hall. Yeah, that would definitely be a big moment in everything. <laughs> and last but not least, um, both of you, if you would tell folks how they can reach you social media-wise, um, Crystal actually just mentioned social media, and I, we definitely believe in the importance of social media. So, Crystal, I'll start with you again and then come to Isabel, but how can folks reach you through social media if they've been hearing this conversation and have been intrigued by the different things that you've done as well as the virtual concert, which they can still see online even if they – missed it um, on the day that it aired and everything, but definitely let folks know how they can reach you, and I'm going to say the same thing for Isabel. But, Crystal, how can folks reach you? Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and then, actually, there's one more person that we were talking about, performers. Um, his name is Chris Hunter, um, a beautiful voice. Um, and I also want mm. to um, mention him, too, because – He's going places as well. Um, but as far as people being able to reach me, um, thewarrenist.com, T-H-E-W-A-R-R-E-N-I-S-T.com. You can subscribe to my newsletter. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram at the Warrenist, T-H-E-W-A-R-R-E-N-I-S-T. And those are the best ways to reach out to me. Appreciate you. Isabel, how can folks find out about this great Christmas album that you mentioned earlier, and how can they get a a copy of it and find out about the next engagements that you might be having as well, whether they're virtual or whether they are eventually going to be live at some point or another? But how can folks learn more about what you've got going on and about your outstanding music? Okay. I am on YouTube under... Isabel, I-S-O-B-E-L, and Friends. Isabel and Friends is also a website. If you would like to subscribe to the email list, you can put your email address on there, and we will send you our newsletter. 
And you can also hear many free recordings on the website. If you would like to hear the gift of Christmas, we're on Spotify. We're on SoundCloud, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. And I'd love to hear from anyone out there uh, what they think and, and suggestions also for Christmas and holiday music that are their favorites. Sounds like a great idea. Hey, Dean, I need to have you come back in because I just had another brilliant idea. You know, I'm always filled with these brilliant ideas. We don't know how brilliant they are, but they're just brilliant ideas. But, we know, we do have the music tracks that we sometimes play in between our show and all of that. So I'm thinking that we need to go ahead and download some of those tracks so that next week we can actually have some of Isabel's music playing in between our rich conversations that we have on a regular basis. I know that we sometimes put in some of the uh, stuff team of our guys from Ninth Wonder and some of the other artists, but I think that we can definitely do that and add that into the uh, course of what's going on and seeing about that. So, um, Dean, I'm waiting for you to pop in and say yay or day, but I think he's going to say yay and all of that, but I'm thinking that that's a thing that we need to have on a regular basis and definitely incorporate these uh, great songs that Isabel has got on there. So what do you think? You think we can incorporate those into what we've got going on? And by the way, when you get around to naming the shows, we've just added another one. I know we added the one last week, but we've added another another one because Nancy has agreed to bring her education show, which will be on the international broadcast media, which will be called Learning mm-hmm. Unwrapped. So everything you want to know about the world of education and how they're trying to make this a better world of education, she's bringing it onto our audio platform. So she's agreed, and that first show will air this Thursday, which means it'll air sometime with us next week. But definitely, we're adding an education show to go with our show with the mother and her kids. So we've just added two new <laughs> shows here on our audio platform. That works. <laughs> that works. No cool. Thank you so, so, you so about- much for this opportunity. No problem. Glad to have both of y'all on and everything. So, uh, Dean, you've been backstage listening. What did you think of these two amazing ladies? One is in that rural area of Warren County and doing this great blog about that community and everything. And, of course, Isabel doing this great Christmas music as well as classical music and everything else. But I know that you were able to relate to a lot of these things because you moved from Virginia up to uh, New Jersey area and work up there. So you know about the rural to urban move and you definitely have uh, had friends that have been entrepreneurs and you've definitely got friends that have been involved in entertainment so I'm sure that you were able to relate to a lot of the things that we were talking about but if you want to give any thoughts to what you heard to these ladies I'm sure they would love to hear that and then of course any words you've got about what's coming where they can catch these on our umpteen platforms well before I made it to New Jersey I went to Oak Brook Terrace Illinois right outside of Chicago Went to Oakland, California, Montgomery, Texas, and then made my way to northern New Jersey. Went back to Virginia, and now I'm in southern New Jersey. So I've been around a few places, and it speeds up, it slows down, it slows all the way down, and then it speeds up again. So, you know, you kind of get used to it after you've done it. But the first, when you first get there, man, that's a shock to the system. And and once you get past that shock and start getting into it, the flow of things, you know, you're able to kind of um, make it work. You know what I mean? But we definitely thank Dr. Bartz and Ms. Myrick for being with us tonight. We greatly appreciate y'all and we thank you. It's Straight Talk with Dana Mark, y'all, Monday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to catch our replay tomorrow and Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock on the Skyhawk Radio Network. And if you miss those, we still got more replays on Radio Public, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, CastBox, Pod follow, Deezer, Jay Savin, and right here on Blog Talk Radio, 
and we are part of the Level Podcast Network, where you can find the Black Girls Guide to Surviving Menopause, um, Chef Gang Radio Show, Funk from the Front Seat, Funk Music with Zach, Let's K-12 Better, the new show Learning Unwrapped, the Mark Lee Show, Mona Shakes and Minority Report, Mulling Music and Memories with Mark Lee, the online dinner party with Mark Lee, uh, she's on call. I'm thinking of the Just Podcast, <laughs> the Spin It Social Hour, it. Virginia sure. Interfaith Live, Western New York Original Music. Uh, it's the one with Russ. I can't remember the whole name of it. I'm losing it. I'm trying to. See, so that's why I need to write stuff down. But all of those shows and us right here, Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. But like I always say, when you walk outside your front door, it's showtime. And the world is just stage. Just make sure that people are not watching the rehearsal. With that being said, it's a six-man Dean Geronimo. Three more shows in 2020. Have an outstanding week. And guess what, y'all? We'll see y'all in seven days. And we'll be having some more great guests. I'm already in the process of lining them up. Don't know exactly who they'll be, but I'll be texting or emailing uh, Dean, and he'll be letting y'all know in advance, maybe the day of, or maybe I'll be actually ahead of the game and let him know a few days ahead of the game so that we can definitely let y'all know who's getting ready to come on the show. But it was great having Crystal and Isabel on, and I look forward to some more great guests on next week. But until then, like Dean said, we're out of here. Peace.